I've been fascinated for years by the idea that randomness can improve computer calculations. I've also been terribly confused by it. I think I've now sorted it out. There are three different ways in which randomness can help computation. The first one is noisy computation, then there's stochastic computation, and then there's probabilistic computation. And those are three different things. Let's have a look. Random numbers are a resource for many computations. You use them when you don't know exactly what you're dealing with. That might be because data is uncertain, or you don't have the data, or you know you have unknown unknowns that may random perturbations. Calculations that use random numbers are basically everywhere in financial management, climate models, artificial intelligence, you name it. But computers weren't meant to do random things. So what one normally does is to take what's called a pseudo random number generator. These are deterministic algorithms that produce numbers that look for all practical purposes random. For example, you can pick some digits of pi star starting at a position that you seed from the exact time of the day. But that takes up computational power and that seems somewhat unnecessary. There's so much randomness around us, why not use something of that? And indeed, the first application of noise in computing is to provide that randomness. These devices are known as true random number generators or hardware random number generators. They exploit various sources of noise. Some are quantum in nature, such as electricity electronic noise, others come from non-quantum chaos or metastable systems. These have been in use for about 10 years, and while they have been implemented here and there, especially for cryptographic protocols, researchers are only now beginning to explore what else this noise could be good for. For example, one can use the noise in circuits not just to produce random numbers, but to change how the circuits operate. At low levels of noise, they might behave very predictably, at intermediate levels very randomly, and at high levels they become more predictable again, because noise tends to amplify some processes and drowns out others. But they operate differently at high noise than at low noise. Basically turning up and down the noise level allows you to create circuits that can switch from one mode to another. Just exactly what that's good for, I guess we'll see when the thing demands that we call it hell. This brings me to the the second point, stochastic computing. Stochastic computing is a different way of calculating with bit strings. Usually in a computer, we use a bit string to represent a number. In stochastic computing, one uses a bit string to represent the probability of a truth value. For this, one only counts the number of zeros and ones in the string, but the position doesn't matter. Say you have the string 0100, that would be 25% true, 75% false. The thing is now that if you have two bit strings of the same length representing different probabilities and you multiply multiply them bit by bit, then the result has the right probability automatically. That's to say, if you repeat this for many bit strings representing your probabilities, then you average the results, you get the right answer. Here's the simplest possible example. Suppose we want to multiply 50% times 50% with two bit strings. If you randomly pick, then the 50% could be represented by either 0, 1 or 1, 0. This means we have four possible results. Now we read these results again as probabilities and take the average. I got tired and asked ChatGPT, which said the result is a probability of 137.5%. So, um, Let's better do this ourselves. I get 2 times 50% plus 2 times 0% divided by 4, which is 25%. And this is correct. It works for any length of the string and any probability. The reason for doing this is that this type of multiplication is fast and easy. It saves time and energy. The downside is that the length of the string determines how accurate your probabilities are. This means if you want very accurate results, you need long strings and you need to sample them a lot, which makes the computations more energy intensive again. This is why stochastic computing, even though the idea has been around since the 1940s, is barely being used today. However, things are changing. This is because stochastic computing could be a great energy saver in cases where you don't need high accuracy. This is why it's presently being considered for the Internet of Things that are devices with tags that tell you 
where they are and how they're doing. Maybe if your fridge knows that you're out of milk with 99% probability, that's good enough. The third way of using randomness is probabilistic computation. For this, one uses hardware that's especially suited to solving certain optimization problems. Suppose I ask you to calculate the sounding modes of a square plate. Ugh, you might say, go away. Okay, but instead of doing the calculation, you could sprinkle sand on the plate and put a speaker underneath it. What's happening? The sound puts the plate into motion and makes the sand randomly jump around. But where the plate doesn't move much, there's not much jumping. So in those areas, the sand piles up. These are the optimal places for the sand to be. And those optimal places answer your question. There's your standing mode. Probabilistic computing works based on the same idea. You want to find an optimal state as the solution. And for that, you configure a system so that its optimal state answers your question. You might not be all that interested in square plates, but similar optimization problems can be found everywhere in real life. That's task scheduling, route and fleet optimization, airplane boarding, supply chain optimization, package delivery, seed plants, taxi timing, you name it. Even solving Sudoku puzzles is an optimization problem. For a probabilistic computer, you now use a system that has an energetically preferred state and you encode your question into that state. You're apply some randomness and then you let the system relax into that ground state. The most commonly used system is known as the Ising model. In this model, individual states have a spin and they couple to each other in ways that you specify. This type of computing goes under the name annealing because it's very similar to what happens in some crystals where the term had previously been used. Yes, that's the same annealing which D-Wave does, except they use quantum annealing, where one also has entanglement between the spins. Since the entanglement is very fragile, these computers need to be cooled to near absolute zero. It's a type of probabilistic computation where the randomness is provided by quantum effects. You get more punch out of it because of the entanglement, but that has the downside of needing this extensive cooling. You don't need the entanglement. However, you can do a annealing without quantum anything. In that case, you need another source for the randomness. For this, you can take one of the two random number generators. But then, in contrast to quantum annealing, you can make that work at room temperature. There's been loads of work on this in the past years, and these non-quantum annealing chips are actually quite impressive. The currently largest one comes from Tokyo University. Their prototype has 4,096 coupled spins and they just published test results. They compared the performance of their chip with that of a conventional computer on which you simulate what the chip does. For this, they used a benchmark test called the max cut problem. The task is to try and cut a network into two so that one cuts the maximum number of links. Their annealing chip used merely 2.9 watts, whereas the standard computer used 200 watts. And it took about 1,000 seconds, where the standard computer took almost an hour. That's amazing. Several other companies are working on similar chips, for example, Toshiba and Fujitsu. The issue with the annealing chips is similar to quantum computers in that they don't scale easily. You can't just lump several of them together and get a bigger one. That doesn't work. The other issue is that our example with the square plate illustrates they need the right level of noise. If the noise is too low, the sound doesn't jump and you're not optimizing anything. If the noise is too high, you never find the optimal state. All of this might make you wonder now, if noise is so useful, why are the quantum computing people stressing out so much about it? Why don't they just use it? The reason is that to use noise, you need to know what the noise is doing. And they have no idea what's up with the noise in their quantum computers, which is interesting in itself, don't you think? These examples of using randomness in computing are part of a more general trend that we're seeing, which is that we're going away from all purpose architecture to having specialized hardware for different tasks. It's like the industrial revolution is coming to integrated circuits. Next thing you 
you know, integrated circuits are form labor unions and ask for health insurance. Knowledge is power. I really believe that. And there's no better place to grow your knowledge than Brilliant.org. Whether you're into coding, math, science, or just want to level up your problem-solving skills, Brilliant's interactive courses make learning really fun and engaging. Whether you want to know more about solar panels, neural networks, astrophysics, special relativity, or computational biology, Brilliant has you covered. And they're adding new courses each month. And of course, I have a special offer for viewers of this channel. If you use my link brilliant.org slash Sabine, you'll get to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for full 30 days and you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Links in the description below, so go and check this out. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.